So this afternoon's talk will be on compassion. Um, maybe to say um, even more precisely self-compassion, but then self extending compassion to ourselves then allows us to widen it to others and to our world. And I had mentioned already that there's this old wise uh, Buddhist proverb that says, for the bird to fly, it needs two wings of wisdom and compassion. Um, because if we only focus on wisdom in our practice, we could easily become a little dry or maybe judgmental, um, arrogant. And if we only focus on compassion, who did somebody say it? We could become, the Dalai Lama said, a good-hearted fool. <laughs> I like that, the good-hearted fool. But it's not so bad. If everybody would be a good-hearted fool, it actually would be a better world, wouldn't it? But both of it in, in kind of balance is definitely um, the best. Um, so together, mindfulness and compassion give us a psycho-spiritual container to hold whatever comes up with gentleness and care. And I, I like this idea of a psycho-spiritual uh, container, kind of a metaphorical container with which we, we can hold our life experiences. The Buddha called compassion tenderness of the heart. Here I love this um, quote by Jack Cornfield. He says, compassion arises naturally as the quivering of the heart in the face of pain, ours and another's. When we come to rest in the great heart of compassion, we discover a capacity to bear witness to, suffer with, and hold dear with our own vulnerable, <clears throat> with our own vulnerable hearts the sorrows and beauties of the world. When, when, when we come to rest in the great heart of compassion, we, dis, we discover a capacity to bear witness to, suffer with, and hold dear with our own vulnerable hearts the sorrows and beauties of the world. And I think that really hits the mark. So I wanted to just talk a bit about self-compassion which is a fairly um, new concept. And I once asked Jack Cornfield, um, where does this come from in the sutras? And he says it doesn't come really anywhere from in the sutras. It's what he calls um, a skillful means, something that's useful to our practice right now. And I have to say, when I started to meditate in Sri Lanka, I didn't know about self-compassion. Actually, I didn't know much about compassion. They didn't talk that much about that. And uh, what happened first is I became, in a way, I was a good student, a diligent student, but I became my own enemy a bit. Even though after, let's say, half hour, 45, an hour of meditation, I would mellow out and come into, you know, a sense of um, direct experience, it was a hard way to get there because I would be quite judgmental every time I would get distracted, my mind would be crazy and I would, you know, um, not really be practicing as I felt I should. And so learning about self-compassion really from Jack, who was the one who taught me most about it, made practice a lot more easy and actually efficient. I remember there was this one time about uh, 15 years ago when I was at a 10-day uh, mindfulness retreat and he had me do a whole um, 10 days morning to night um, compassion and then compassion practice. And not just when I was sitting, but when I was going to bed, when I was getting up, when I was brushing my teeth, when I was getting dressed, when I was eating. And it was a really profound experience. It felt like something that was kind of numb and maybe a little hard, um, frozen, 
kind of became um, really soft and, and open and at actually at first kind of quite achy. And, uh, but after these 10 days, I felt that a, a big kind of burden, whoops, a burden had been lifted. So self-compassion, I wanted to say, is not self-indulgence. And that's uh, one of the concerns often people have. Is this just coddling ourselves? Is it not just um, uh, wasting time? Will I still be a digil diligent uh, practitioner if, if I am uh, um, compassionate towards myself? And... Um, it is not self-pity either. It is a really, um, maybe what Martin Buber said, an I-thou experience, a respect but from a, a full person to the full person we are ourselves. And uh, it allows us to be more present. And it's about a willingness to suffer with ourselves a readiness to experience our sensations and emotions of hurt with non-judgmental kindness. And I found that actually not so easy. It was kind of an interesting, uh, uh, challenging, but very rewarding uh, exercise. Now it, the music is starting again, which is nice, but it, thank you. It's a very, very uh, silent music. Do you hear that too? I like it. So, <laughs> so here's John Velvet. Um, a psychologist and an author who says, you can't have compassion unless you are first willing to feel what you feel. And that's a really important point, to be willing to feel what we feel, because so often we are kind of annoyed or frustrated with ourselves. Why am I depressed right now? Or why am I frustrated right now? Or why is this anxiety coming up again? So there is this willingness to feel what we feel that's really important. And so where we often feel what we feel is in our bodies. You probably, you might have heard about the research of Bessel van der Kolk. He wrote this uh, book, um, uh, The Body Never Lies. And so, so often we feel our feelings in our bodies, like our fear as a tension, maybe we feel cold as a tightness around our chest or heart. Um, there might, or as a nausea in our belly, there might be anger as a tightness in the, um, in the uh, chest or again in the jaw. There is, um, uh, all kinds of shame, maybe in our face, uh, or envy might make us cold. So we, we feel what we feel in our body. And so being present to the physical sensations brings us into the present moment. Being present to the physical sensations of pain softens and unlocks our heart. <coughs> okay. so I wanted to talk a little bit about the concept of the felt sense, which is a special kind of internal bodily awareness, a body sense of meaning, which the conscious mind is first unable to articulate. And that concept was formed by Eugene Gentling. The felt sense helps us to recognize when we are afraid, hurt, angry or ashamed, and to gain insight into the meaning of this experience for us. The depth of this understanding 
allows us to access the ability to extend compassion to ourselves and others. So when we really feel what we feel in our bodies, which um, means that we allow ourselves to be vulnerable, then um, our heart and our minds and our uh, whole being can soften and is more available to others. So you might ask, how can we hold our distress with kindness and care during the day and not just in formal practice? And I think that's something somebody asked uh, just before the break after the last session. So they're internal respites and on-the-go practices. Internal respites are deliberate pauses built into our day, a time to set intention at the beginning of a project, for example. Let's say I'm, I'm driving with my car into town or um, uh, Michael tells me, oh, I have to go into a difficult family meeting or I see um, a difficult client or um, I'm giving a talk today. So all those times would be a good time to set an intention in the beginning of a project or a time to refocus in mindful and heartfelt ways. When we can practice intentional respites independently of how things are going for us. So that is important to uh, make it a practice. And um, for example, I saw a young researcher from UCSB who had a lot of anxiety problems. So, and he worked a lot on the computer. I think he was an electrical engineer. So he would set every one hour, 50 minutes, uh, a little timer on his uh, computer. And for 10 minutes, he would um, do a little mindfulness practice. And he said his colleagues wouldn't even notice because he was still sitting in front of his computer. So we can find smart and sometimes sneaky ways to bring mindfulness into our practice. Or to set a time, uh, to set a dedication at the end of the day. That's really skillful too. Examples might be using hand washings as a time of mindfulness and self-compassion. Uh, many physicians, nurses um, do that. When meeting a new person, saying to yourself, just as I want to be happy, so this person wants to be happy. That might be a skillful way of, of working. To remind, that's uh, something the Dalai Lama often teaches. He says, even people who are kind of annoying or angry people, also they want to be happy, even though they go about it in a very unskillful way. So, um, then I wanted to talk a little bit of on-the-go self-compassion practices. And so there's a little group of phrasings which I developed and, you know, they can be adjusted and you can be creative with them. And so um, maybe for a moment, just close your eyes. And think of a time when you felt frustrated or scared or maybe embarrassed. Something that happened recently. Maybe don't take the worst situation, a mild to moderate situation. Remember what time of day it was. What the light was like. Who was around. The atmosphere in the room. And now begin to notice what you're feeling, even now as you remember. 
You might remember what you felt then, but also notice what you feel now in your body. A tightness, an ache, a numbness. And allow yourself to feel what you're feeling, the felt sense. Stay with the felt sense and extend kindness to yourself. You might say, may I be gentle with myself right now. May I extend compassion to myself in this moment. And then, when ready, return to breath. <coughs> Notice breath flowing through you. Let yourself be connected to the big breath of life. 